as a war survivor, I you know I always think about how we put the human element in anything, how we excel. Hello, welcome to episode 196 of the Smart Agents Podcast. As always, my name is Michael Walter and I'll be your host. On today's episode, we are joined by Phoenix-based real estate professional Ali Alasadi. Escaping a war-torn Iraq, Ali found himself as a refugee in a brand new country in 1995. By 98, he'd obtained his license, selling more than $4.5 million in real estate his rookie year. Over the course of our conversation, Ali shares how his experiences in the refugee camp has shaped his real estate business, how he has built that more than 25-year career, and why sustainable living has become such a major passion of his. But before we get on to the day's featured interview, the Smart Agents Magazine is available and full of insights and strategies designed to help real estate agents grow their businesses. Inside, you'll find interviews and advice from leading real estate professionals, marketing tips to flood your business with leads, and even swipe and deploy files full of practical tools to enhance your business. Be sure to click the link in the episode description to claim a free digital issue. Also, if you enjoy this conversation, be sure to like and subscribe. The Smart Agents podcast streams on all major podcasting platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and of course, YouTube. And finally, if you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message to feedback at smartagents.com. We're always on the lookout for new stories to share. All right, let's get on to the day's featured interview with Ali Alasadi. It was a true honor to speak with him, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. So getting started, I'd love for you to share uh, a bit about your background and how you found yourself in the Phoenix market. Thank you very much, man. Thank you for having me. Um, I came to the U.S. in 1995 as a refugee from Iraq. Um, I don't remember. I mean, I don't know if you remember. There was the Gulf War in 1991. Iraq invaded Kuwait. Then Iraq was kicked out of Kuwait. Also, a lot of people don't know there was an uprising happening in Iraq where people wanted to change uh, from dictatorship to a democracy. I was part of that. And make a long story short, the uprising was crushed by Saddam's army, and then we started fleeing to the southern border, which is the border with Kuwait, and... The American troops and the coalition, they provided us with the safe haven to keep us away from Saddam's guard and Saddam's army. Then later, we were airlifted to Saudi Arabia, which is the only country that was willing to take us and provide us uh, safe haven. So there, I spent about four years in the refugee camp. It was a really introduction to the Bedouin life. I'm a city boy. You know, now I'm I'm living in the tent for four years. Uh, it was really humbling and learning experience, you know, because there, you know, we've seen like different people, different ages, uh, you know, from people with PhD to people who have also no school, you know, and then suddenly find yourself with the group, you know. Um, and then also like adjustment, you know, no, not having electricity, you know, or not having running water because we would hold the water. Tankers of water would bring it to the camp and we'd fill like jugs and things like that. And that's our water source and, you know, for cooking, baiting and everything. From there, you know, I, I really tried to escape the camp multiple times. I got cut. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and worst thing they do for you back there, they can attach the worst charge. They will say, hey, uh, are you a spy? I'm like, well, my father was executed by Saddam's government, and my oldest brother was executed. So I said, how would I love a government like that? You know, how would I be a spy? Right. So you know, I was released, and then I was one of the first... I don't know how familiar are you with the refugee process, but uh, the way it works, it's you has to, you have to establish either persecution or fear of persecution in your country or foraging, and then that's how you're gonna get established as a refugee. So a basic concept. So in the camp, we were doing like demonstration, you know, almost daily, like, hey, get us out of here. 
Uh, we send letters to the UN, to different embassies around the world, it's like, hey, we're here, we want to get out of this area. The Saudis, that was in Saudi Arabia, so the Saudis are like, hey, we don't have a problem. You want to go visit the embassies? You know, we choose a few people, we'll send a delegation to uh, any embassy you want to enter, and then, you know, see if they will take you. So when that happened, we learned that also, like, we need to establish through the UN first. Um, and, you know, from there, the UN will, you know, uh, present these cases to U.S. delegation, the French, the British, Canada, and then Scandinavia. So that's happened, and then I was very excited, and I was one of the first 400 people got interviewed. And then people numbers that were behind me, they were getting process and travel to the U.S., to the Canada, and, you know, the Scandinavia. So I thought, like, I think I should do something about it. So I went to the U.N. office, um, and the camera was very difficult to leave, you know, so unless your name is in the, in the list, basically getting called for interview, you cannot leave the refugee camp. So I somehow I figured out a way to get out. So I did. I got to the UN office and I asked interpreters, like, hey, can you interpret for me with the UN office? He was like, yeah, I only work for the US delegation. I don't work for the UN. So I said a few uh, not so friendly words. <laughs> <laughs> and I walked into the UN office and I started sweating. We study English in my language, like in my country, you know. Uh, but we, I never spoke it. That would be the first time I spoke it, you know. It was like, I'm in the front of the lion now. Like, what do I say? So I walked in, and um, one time the UN, two of the UN employees, he was, he was there. His name was Francis. So I walked in. I started sweating. Heat started going through my neck, my hip. <laughs> And I said, um, hi, Francis, you remember me? And uh, he said, yeah, you're the basketball player. And I said, uh, start thinking about what to say now. I said, I'm tired. He said, everybody's tired. <laughs> um, and then I had the courage. I put myself together. I said, well, people get into ch chances, three chances, you know, and I get no chance. So he shrugged his shoulder and he's like, what can I do? I said, help me. He said, okay, I'll help you. I said, promise, because I heard of the promise, and then people keep their promises. So Francis said, okay, I promise. Later, you know, he said, I was not destined to come to the U.S., actually. Francis sent me, a, um, like, a, like to uh, come to his office and, I went there and he said, New Zealand never took refugees, so I'm going to send you plus three other refugees uh, to New Zealand as kind of sample. <laughs> and I said, okay. So so now I have this hope to get out, and I'm like, okay, why do I need an interpreter? Why I have to go through that embarrassment or difficulty you know, with speaking the language? So that time I had a friend in Syria, and he's like, I cannot send you clothes, I cannot send you money, I can send you books. So I said, get me a book that goes beyond learning English in seven days. Because <laughs> <laughs> we had those, speak English in seven days. So I did, he sent me a book called English for Old Levels, um, and I created a circle, I said, hey, Michael, you are, you are about to travel. Would you like to learn a few words before you travel? So we start doing that, like memorizing, you know, things. Because once you learn the grammar, then I think it's easy to, everything will follow. Then you memorize, this is a microphone, this is a light, you know, this is a tool or, or a screwdriver, whatever. So New Zealand never came. Now I have my best friend, Francis, like Francis, Send me anywhere in Earth other than this refugee camp. So Francis, like a month later, it's like, hey, I think I'm going to send you to the U.S. And uh, a month later, my name was in the list. 
And I had the interview. Uh, actually, we had to go through about three different interviews um, that we get vetted. Then I came to the United States in 1995. Wow. And so how, how old were you when all this was going on? I was in my late 20s. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't want to reveal how old I am. <laughs> right. <laughs> no. It doesn't sound like a lady. No. no. <laughs> um, I was, yeah, late my, my late 20s. When I arrived, you know, it's almost since like 30 years old. Um, 95, I came through New York. That was the port of entry. I was very excited to know that I'm going to Phoenix as I knew what the word meant, you know, and it's, it's the bird rising from the ashes, the, the reincarnation, you know, and like, great, you know, this is perfect with the new beginning, you know. Right, right. So tell me about, um, you know, when you, once you got to Phoenix and uh, imagine it took a while to, to get settled and things, but how did your, how did your, um, interest in in real estate start and and in the real estate industry begin absolutely uh growing up i grew up with two brothers though who introduced me early in their life i was like really a baby you know and um and they built houses so when they took me i still sense the smell of the of the cement we built back home our houses are bricks and I remember, I you know, I just I remember it's like yesterday. I, I feel the sense of concrete, of the the brick when you water it, and you know you have that aroma or whatever. I don't know about call right. it aroma, but so it's always in the back of my mind. But I, you know, I just thought like I, you know, we always owned home. You know, like we, we this idea of renting was just like oh, you know. Uh, Excuse me. And then over time, like we, you know, we're living with other roommates, and I've seen it in the camp. Now I've seen it in college. I've seen it now here in the U.S. So frankly, I was really tired of it. I wanted my independence. I met a guy. Um, he owned a duplex. So we start talking about that, and uh, I really loved the idea of living on one side, having income from the other side. So. Little by little, I became very interested in real estate. You know, I, I was interpreter for a lot of my friends who bought houses, you know, and finally the loan officer was like, Adi, why don't you get paid for your services? Why don't you go and get a license? So it's such, you know, the idea start uh, mature in my head. And uh, I did also work with refugees for, for about four years, you know, trying to give back and there was only limited number of Iraqis who spoke fluent English. You know, I was one of them. So from there, you know, I'm like, okay, I want to do that duplex thing. Then I start exploring the fourplexes, the threeplex. You know, I'm like, okay, well, I can get two rents instead of one. And then later, I really screw up my credit because I got laid off. I was working in an electric company, twelve hours, sometimes sixteen hour shift, six days a week was great. But and then I got laid off and I was sending money back home because I don't know if you remember. Iraq was under embargo at that time and and people make like sixty dollars a week, you know, and so I sent a lot of money. I said one time a lump sum and then immediately after that I got laid off. So I screwed up my credit big time and I decided I got a job in the IRC or International Rescue Committee. And I thought, like, you know, what does it take? You know, so I met with the, I actually attended classes in NHS of Phoenix. Uh, now they call them trellis. And the upper home ownership classes, and I began to learn, and I'm like, well, this is complicated. Back home, it's like, hey, how much, how much you want for your house? This much, here's the cash. Done. Right. But here we got the lender, we got title, we got so many elements. So I learned so much from there. And also in it just really not only just like get you ready for the house, but also prepare your credit and things like that. They're like, here, you really, (laughs) 
you really messed up your credit here, so you need to fix all these elements. Um, so I started, began to fix it. And make long story short, in 2018, I'm sorry, in 1998, that's when I bought my first property, was a triplex that had like a little storage in the back that I turned into uh, the fourth unit, you know, which is a studio. Right. Yeah. Where and then so from the time of you know purchasing your own your own home and you know getting into the real estate investing side with the with the additional rent coming in, uh, how did that morph into getting your own license and and you know actually representing clients looking to purchase their own homes? Absolutely. Um, while I was working in IRC, I'm very ambitious person. I like to move up in anything I'm doing, like whether I'm playing basketball or writing a poem or painting something, it has to look great. There's certain perfection to it. I'm not perfectionist. I could be very messy. So with real estate, you know, I, I began to learn uh, about different elements of it. And um, so I started investing. Then I began to like it. I, you know, I read all kind of books that related to investing and um, including Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, I really like the concept of multi-dwelling. And then I met an attorney who never practiced law and that's all what he did. He did apartment complexes. And I was like, wow, you know, we can't, we looked at the profit and loss and things like that. It was really, really uh, lucrative. So I began with that, and then uh, IRC, oh, talking about moving up, IRC was, I mean, the best I can do, be, like, from case manager to maybe a program coordinator, you know. And, and the pay, you know, nonprofit don't pay well. So I wanted to have, like, a cushion, you know, and in 2003, I went and I got my license. I actually... Left IRC and then I was uh, I developed program for the the home ownership program. Okay. When you uh, got your license, um, tell me about the you know the brokerage that you you went to to work for and what it was about that specific brokerage that attracted you. Oh, excellent question. Uh, the first brokerage I worked for uh, is called High Profile Realty. And the biggest thing I tried to do, they sent me the CD. You remember the CDs? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm that old, yes. <laughs> Most companies, they would send a letter, uh, things like that. So I thought that was very cool. I put the CD, it has a video, it has some uh, of their program structure. The biggest thing for me was looking for was like, it was the training program because school will teach you the legal aspect of practicing real estate but the practice that's what i was interested in like the practical aspect of real estate and i had very great mentors and uh, instructors you know who went through a step-by-step program for you know closing your first deal you know to um uh CMA program and things like that. And uh, I did well. I mean, I did 4.4 million as a rookie. That was something like, you know, remember 90, uh, I'm sorry, 2003, the prices was not like the prices right. today. Right. But my attitude was every year I learned how much I didn't know the year before. And that it, it transferred until today, you know, like I'm constantly learning. And, you know, as an instructor also, you have to know because you don't want to, you're sitting asking a question. Or like, mm, good question, but let me get back to you. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. When, as you, uh, you know, even, even in that rookie year, um, you know, finding the success you did and then obviously uh, the success that followed that, how were you marketing yourself and, you know, bringing in uh, new leads and meeting clients? One thing I know about myself, I'm a people person. When I was working with refugees, I really treated them fairly. I had the patient, 
um, I had that that instructor teacher mentality, you know, where we do cultural orientation for them. And through this process, I start meeting community leaders because I work with about 18 different nationalities. And then I forge really good relationship with them through that, or even when I left the IRC, you know, I start taking them to lunches. I said, hey, this is what my new venture in my life. Uh, I pursue a career in real estate. How about if we sit down and see how can we help your community? Because it's always in me to teach, you know. And um, what we did with them is like we done a couple classes. They invited me to their Independence Day. Some of these guys, they oppose their gov- existing government, so they have their political affiliation, which I have nothing to do with. But that's how they get together. And um, so I asked this one guy is from Liberia. I said, "Would you recommend you to uh, recommend me to your uh, community?" He said, "I do. Thursday we do on the Independence Day of Liberia. Why don't you come over and they'll put you on the stage?" But whoa, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. You know, um, I said. And then from that point, I learned also African minutes is different than New York minutes. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, you know, is the point you brought up there is, um, you know, meeting with the, the community leaders and getting involved with the specific communities. Because I have to imagine, um, you know, inside in a city like Phoenix or anywhere around the country that has large refugee populations, I think, you know, people that maybe don't have experience, you know, with, uh, you know, being a refugee themselves like you or just, you know, working for an organization doesn't realize how many communities are in that, you know, it's not just, it's not one community. There are very, uh, there are a lot of small communities within that. And I think, you know, making those relationships with those individual community leaders is a, is a great way to, um, you know, uh, present yourself as that teacher and as that, you know, the person that's hoping to, uh, looking to help, you know, these, uh, these refugees get into a home. Absolutely. I, it, in many cultures around the world, even in America, I think it's all about sometimes like, Michael, let's have lunch, you know, it's about breaking that bread. You know, this, I don't know, there's something comes with that. Now you can see that in the Italian culture, Middle Eastern and in fact, some of them, they might get obsessed, like, oh, okay, let's take care of that first, and then we talk business. I'm like, what do you mean, am I going to drink my tea, or am I going to have lunch? Let's have lunch, you know. It, it's that, um, I think that's level of understanding the culture and how they operate. A lot of them don't, uh, it's a new thing for us, like, you know, I consider myself somewhat educated man, you know, and I read a lot of book, books, and then I met the pre- the head of the U.S. delegation in Saudi Arabia, and we t- we spent hours talking, you know, and because I want to practice my English with him, <laughs> and he he saw my passion, like how I talk about the uprising, is the greatest thing happened since the twenties, and he's like, Ali, when you go to the United States. Uh, don't expect them to receive you as a hero. And I thought that was insulting, you know. And and I said, Jeff, why are you saying that? Um, I, it's kind of hurt my feeling. And he's like, Adi, you will meet people that probably don't know where Iraq is or right. don't know what countries border the U.S. <laughs> And I was, it was shocking for me, like, you know, as I said, like with all the books I read or the video I watched, so when when refugee comes, I think this is all transitional life. You know, like how do I learn the language? How do I learn the system? How do I act in a party? How can I act in a classroom? Um, how do I deal with my children, my parents, and and so on? There's just so much for refugees to learn. We do cultural orientation when we when I was in IRC. Ultimately, it's like how you touch them, how you how they perceive you as a person. Like I went in, um, in the soccer field where one of those community leaders, he was the coach there. And I said, uh, you know, I want to see how you're coaching style. So I'm going to be coaching the coach, you know. And 
So I went there, I saw the soccer ball. It's, it's almost torn, you know, that they play. So the next time I showed up to the practice, I showed up with five different balls, you know, and, you know, I put my name on it. It was like, that's a gift, you know, that's the American way. <laughs> <laughs> so they were, I mean, that's lifted them up, you know, it's just a really a small cost, you know, and a really basic thing. But to them, it meant the world. They they play soccer the back home, so they try to keep that soccer, keep the younger or the youth together, you know, on those programs. Uh, but it was hard for them, you know, to buy a soccer ball, you know. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they were absolutely. very happy about that. Right, absolutely. And I think that, you know, really that concept of, um, you know, just being there to provide for the members of your community, mm-hmm. I think that, that crosses um, any, you know, whether or not you're an agent that is working, you know, with, you um, you know, refugees or in, you know, people in that situation or just, you know, the people that live right down the street from you. Um, just, I think that concept of being there, being there, being there for them, providing value to their life, I think is such a, a great way to uh, operate your real estate business because it, it it makes everything not transactional. You, you yeah, create real relationships with people. Absolutely. I always say going beyond the transaction or going before the transaction. It's what you do, how they connect with you as a human being, you know, as a father, as a husband. I have clients to ask, they ask me for marital advice. I'm like, hey, I've been married. It's going to be our 25th year anniversary. And I was like, how did you guys stay together? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like a lot of yes, man, yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's really a privilege and honor where, where people like they open up to you in, in that regard. So, like, when the real estate transaction comes, these people have no doubt that you will take care of them. You know, um, I, and then also, I think one of the biggest things uh, agents make mistakes by thinking like I can serve everyone and it's not true sometimes you cannot meet the expectation of certain person or a certain level you know whatever so it's saying no I you know I learned that later in my career um you know I have no fear of saying to the buyer or sellers like hey you know I had a Situation where the seller was really want to overprice their home by over a hundred grand, and I said, um, "You won." He's like, "What are you talking about?" And I said, "Well, you were the highest bidder. Why bother put it in the market to discover it was sitting in the market for about six months? Then you will ask me at that time why the house did not sell. I'll answer you today because it's overpriced." You think your house is worth, in the, worth more than any other house in the market. So you are the winner. So stay in it. You know, price list to sell or list to own. You know, that's the difference. Right. When you, uh, when you have a conversation like that with a seller, um, you know, I have to imagine at, at some point, you know, they will realize that yes, you were you were correct, and yeah. and the house was you know overpriced. What's the uh, what's the reaction, or uh, if it is somebody that you do continue to work with when they you know they come around and say, yeah, you know, you really you really do know your your market, and yeah, I appreciate the, you for giving me this information. Well, believe me, I mean, the, when I said I learned how to say no. Um, and that's really after the fact that educating the seller or the buyer is the key, you know, like, so when we do market analysis, I go beyond, I look at the tax record, I look at the, we call it the CMA or comparative market analysis. I look at with Zillow, even though I don't trust Zillow, they lost about half a billion dollars in their estimate. And I bring that to the client, you know. So because I know what they're thinking, they what what they think their house worth, 
and they are bringing to reality. I said, there's absolutely no price I can put where your child said their first word. There's no price in the world that I can increase your value. If that's substantial for you, but it doesn't really translate for a dollar uh, when the buyer trying to envision themselves in your house. And another factor, I you know sometimes sellers like my house or not let my house to be this or not give my house away or I tell them from day one as they start thinking that this is no longer your house. Start packing so this way we can sell the house. Start thinking how the buyer can picture themselves, how they create memory, how they their children will play in that park or go to that school and go to a place of worship or whatever might be their major attraction in the area. So I think educating the client is the key to success here. Whether Again, whether it's buyer or seller. Like I have a buyer comes up one time, came and he said, um, I'm looking for something very specific. And uh, I said, well, how many agents are you working for that specific? He said, uh, six. So I said, it must be a very special property that you need number seven to find you. He said, well, I'm looking for a deal. I said, I'm sorry, I cannot help you. You know, everybody looking for a deal, you know. Uh, and I said, I cannot go work by chance. Maybe I'll earn a living or don't earn a living. With six agents suggesting me are not loyal to any of them. If any of them pick up the phone tomorrow. And so I said, if I find this smoking deal, I'll probably be more lenient to give it to somebody who's loyal with us, who appreciate our business, who refer to our business, invest it in our business, and so on. Right. Uh, I want to, you know, touch on the uh, another big, very big passion of yours: uh, sustainable uh, homes and sustainable living, and really promoting, um, you know, homes with that designation and educating your your buyers and and on uh, homes like that. How did where did that come from? It actually went back to the childhood. My mom owned this piece of land with her uh, with her cousins. Uh, this is like generation after generation. And first summer she sent us there, I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I, I described the mosquitoes at like the size of mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> or it feels like that size when they bite you. And, and also I exaggerate, you know, with their teeth. I said they have metal teeth, you know. So going there, you know, it, it's really opened my eyes. I mean, that's a later time. At that time, we just wasn't sure. 2009, almost everybody was getting out of real estate. I, when I, I went and I got my green designation through the National Association of Realtors. And from there, you know, I start thinking about my mom's cousin, my uncles. And and these people lived the most sustainable life. I mean, they had the farm. They grow what they eat. The cows bring the milk, the butter, the cheese. You know, it's all nice and fresh. It's not refrigerated. It's just right there, you know, um, the river is nearby, they go and fish. The only thing really they didn't slaughter their own animals. Sometimes they go to the market and buy meat from there. I, I think then their house is built out of, they call them here, adobe or, uh, you know, houses built of haystack, you know. So back there, they mix it like uh, mud and haystack, you know. And, and uh, then they did this beautiful... Um, system that didn't have AC. So they have a smaller opening in the bottom and and another opening in the top. So and that allow um, cold air to push uh, warm air outside the building. So it's constantly you have fresh air inside the building. And then from there I'm like, Mom, <laughs> God bless her soul, you know, like and her cousin, they were the most sustainable people. Here, you know, it's very fancy. You got a book, you got 
<laughs> this study book. Well, these people, they, they've done it for years and generation after generation. Right. So with the green designation, what do you, uh, what does that uh, do? And wh how do you incorporate that into um, your, I guess, you know, even your marketing or, you know, the homes that you're looking uh, for your clients? Well, as I said, like, you know, earlier when I mentioned like, you know, even refugees, this is my sound, even a foreign language to people who were born in this country, you know, like what is sustainable? What is energy efficient home? How can I apply this to my life? You know, so sustainability is meeting the need of the future generation without compromising their present. You know, so like it's, it's really about preserving resources, reducing energy, um, healthy living. You know, lead-based paint affects over half a million children in the U.S. Radon gas is called the silent killer. You know, it's odorless. I cannot see it, but you can sense it. The nose might sense it. And mold, you know, it could be like, I always, when, when I teach my classes, I say the small leak can have a ripple effect, you know, and the mold, in the health, you know, if you're not feeling good in your home, you're probably not feeling good at work or in school. So now I have a loss of productivity. If I go to the hospital and now I need more testing, I need more follow-up. And this is just a simple leak, you know. So, and then, and then you get the living organism, you know, just keep growing in your home. That could be, again, like a simple leak, maybe the, the water loop in the refrigerator. A lot of people don't even go and look like, hey, let me check if that's, uh, actually, I discovered that in my own home. Recently, I changed my flooring. And when they removed the baseboard, the wall was like discolored, you know, I'm like, oh, so we end up fixing that leak. And so I think, you know, uh, from real estate perspective, it's a two days course. When I took it, it was three days. I actually approved to teach it. Um, realtor can become the interpreter on how to interpret all these things. Like what is... Um, low price fixes, you know, like, can I improve? I always tell people, like, you can improve the energy efficiency of your home before you put solar. And the way you do it, you can do energy audit. Both SRP and APS offer in it locally. And from there, they will provide you with the list of improvement you can do. We can start with the basic one. I always say the only gun I support is the cock and gun. <laughs> so you take that, you seal around the windows, around the doors, uh, can light, they leak like hell, <laughs> um, uh, electric outlets, and seal all those things, you know, just change the rubber, you know, around the main entry door and uh, the Arcadia doors uh, lead into the backyard. And, but just by doing those things, you increase energy a great deal. Actually, you the house will not be unique in air anymore. Another thing is cheap. You know, it's uh, experts is on the shade, you know, it's about 15 to 20 degrees different. So if I come up with the strategy where I can add awning or drapes or even exterior um, uh, drapes, that will improve the energy efficiency of the home. And I still did not replace a window, I didn't put solar yet, and things like that. And then, of course, the more expensive stuff for be replacing the window. Uh, the HVAC system, if it's over 20 years old and I'm not running efficiently, you know, that's uh, some of the other things that could be considered. New units, they are much more efficient than the older one. They are higher sears. Um, and then the carbon, I mean, the freon that is used is not harmful to the environment. In the old one, um, they call it uh, chlorofluorocarbon, and that's the freon, and and uh, the EPA banned that. So all the new AC units, they are much better for the environment. They are much more efficient and most of all, they're quieter. Right. Quieter, quieter. <laughs> what uh, over since you know over the years uh, that you've been in real estate, 
have you seen um, a change in buyers looking for more energy efficient homes? Absolutely. Um, 10 years ago, people would talk about granite countertop, um, ceramic tiles, and things like that. Our kids, they understand the technology aspect of real estate or the disruption that's happening in real estate. The real estate also have their own disruption, and including incorporating technology into the home. Our kids grew up with gadgets, you know, and they love that concept. I can track how my home is performing or how this home can save 100000 over the life of 30 years mortgage. There's a program called ResNet, and they have, like, they can gauge the house. Like an energy auditor comes to the home, they do an energy audit. And most of U.S. homes, there was called about 130, which is very leaky house. And and energy efficiency home, energy efficient home, like if they uh, build or adopt the Energy Star program, that house would be about 60 or below in hers rating, you know, and they have a reference home, they call it like 100. So the bottom line, like a house that score 130, would cost about $200,000 in over 30 years mortgage in utility costs. Now I have a house that a new construction, the builder adopt in a just stop program and that would save me nearly 50% of the energy consumption. That's a good, easy, a good sell, you know, to do. Um, and, and sometimes the buyers, they come and most buyers, they don't understand this. So that's when you, I think that's what differentiate me or my students, you know, once they attend my classes, you know, um, and how to explain to them. Like I work with physician and it was always about the aesthetic. And it was crazy about this one house. I said, well, this builder really adopted a lot of the energy efficiency that we're talking about. I said, would you consider that? He has asthmatic child. I said, this house have a package to improve indoor air quality. Would you consider it? He's like, I'm a doctor and I, where are you bring this stuff from? I'm like, well, that's really my passion is, you know, and as a war survivor, I, you know, I always think about how we put the human element in anything, how we excel. It's simply by putting the human element into things. Uh, before we wrap up, I, I do, you know, I, listening to you talk about the, you know, educating people, you know, whether it's through, uh, you know, the refugee programs that you're involved with or the uh, green uh, you know, the green and sustainable living. Uh, I just have to ask how much, you know, when you, when you look back at, uh, your life and, you know, spending your own time in the, the refugee, uh, camp, you know, uh, could you imagine yourself doing what you're doing now? <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I grew up in the military, uh, with the military family. Like my dad was in the Iraqi army, he was in the medical field for 32 years. So as he moved, we moved. So there's almost, there was no sense of place for us. I mean, I have memories here and there. And my best memory, my best memory is where I grew up, like as a child, I played, that's, I remember that well. And then, you know, the, I defected also from the Iraqi army and that's punishable by execution in Iraq at that time. And, you know, I moved to refugees. So my life was constantly almost like waiting for a decision, waiting for something to happen. I took initiative a lot of things, but I wasn't sure I was going to end up. What a great question. So <laughs> this is the only time really, um, you know, I, when I, I've been doing real estate for 21 years and as a father, as a husband, as a, as a realtor, I feel like, what is my legacy would be? How can I serve humanity? How can I put my word or my action behind my words? 
And, you know, I thought like, why don't I do just something I love, which is teaching and educating? Mm -hmm. So in 2012, I established my own school. I've been teaching one course called Healthy Home Challenges and Solutions. I wrote a few more courses. I teach the NIA Green Designation. And I feel like through that, you know, I'm, I, I might give to society in the best way and leave a legacy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I really do appreciate you taking the time to uh, speak with us. And for anybody that is uh, looking to learn more about, um, you know, uh, green uh, living and, and having, you know, getting those designations or being able to teach their clients those things, where, what what do you have to offer, uh, you know, people to get that kind of education? Well, I have a website that's called Phoenix, phoenixgreenhomeconcept.com. And um Building a website dedicated only to the education aspect, which is Ali Alasadi dot com. So it's A L I A L A S A D Y dot com. Awesome. Well, I really do appreciate you taking the time uh, to share your story and and everything that you've uh, you've been doing. Uh, it really was an honor to talk to you today. Honor is mine, Michael. Thank you so much. I love your show. I love to be part of it. I want to thank Ali for joining us today and sharing his story. Remember, if you're interested in learning more about sustainable living, be sure to check out his websites linked in the episode description. So once again, if you think you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message to feedback at smartagents.com. Well, that wraps things up for this episode. But remember, follow the show wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents YouTube channel. Again, I'm Michael Walter, and we'll see you on the next episode.